The famous line about the sins of the fathers, or as the King James Version has it, the iniquities of the fathers, descending upon their children, was quoted very loosely and was applied to almost every uh, difficulty that arose in the domestic life of our people. As time went on, I guess some folks read the verse more closely, and it has not been used quite so frequently. Because the verse ends with the words, presumably God speaking, of those that hate me, referring to God. Therefore, the verse essentially referred to to those who religiously had turned from the true religion. But still the th thought lingered, and we found a good many instances in which there seemed to be some validity behind uh, this concept. In addition to the formal declarations of faith and the credos that have developed through time, there has been a religion that has gradually built out up around what was rather poetically called the common experience of the neighborhood. Most persons' religions are based upon everyday happenings. If they have a more elaborate theology, they use these happenings to interpret this theology so that in one way or another we all live according to our own experiences of religious matters. And it has been our experience, supported by a certain amount of scientific backing, that the law of heredity actually operates at least to a degree. I don't think we can accept as in the last century with an almost pious enthusiasm the entire Mendelian concept. But we are aware that traits do descend in families, that appearances certainly are transmitted and that where appearance is transmitted, we have a right to suspect uh, that certain other qualities also pass down through families from generation to generation. Uh, Dr. Lovato, the great physiognomist, was convinced that appearance always bears witness to some type of characteristic behind the bodily structure. And if we inherit certain appearances, it is quite possible that we inherit with these certain dispositional tendencies. We know in medicine that certain types of body deficiency, glandular imbalance, uh, descend in families. We have every reason to assume, for example, that hermophilia de descends in families, uh, that uh, certain uh, chronic conditions do move down through uh, the bloodstream of peoples. Also in the larger world families, we observe certain racial predominances, which seem to move in the bloodstreams of these collective groups. And also we observe psychological changes within the structures of nations, in which past history undoubtedly overshadows present events and will contribute to future conditions. Thus we may say that this transmission can be either uh, biological or psychological. And I think for the moment we should uh, give some thought to the psychological transmission by means of which it would appear rather clearly 
uh, that various descendants will be affected by our conduct. In the first place, it has been rather clearly shown that where certain psychological patterns establish themselves within a family, by means of which children are overly influenced in one way or another, either by what we call today the spoilage system or by neglect, it is likely that the total consequence of the bad rearing of a child will continue to have effect for at least from five to seven generations. In other words, this child that has been badly conditioned is going to establish a home in which certain defects of character will influence the security of that home. The, the, the effect may gradually diminish, but it will not entirely vanish for several generations where children will be influenced and modified by the long family pattern which has preceded them. Nearly everyone is born into a family pattern of psychological significance of some kind. Uh, many folks come and ask questions about their family patterns. They realize that grandfather or great-grandfather was unreasonably strict or too dogmatic or much too paternalistic and that the effect of this has continued. And these folks wonder whether this continuance is merely the descent of modifications from the outside of family life or whether it represents something that is carried actually within the psychic entity itself. In both of these explanations or interpretations, a degree of truth can be found. Parents certainly transmit their most secret pressures to their children. Someone asked me only a few days ago what I thought about prenatal influence. I realize that this is scientifically not generally accepted. But there are certainly indications in which prenatal influence has been found to have a valid effect upon the life of a child coming into the world. Prenatal influence uh, very often arises in the deeper parts of the parental nature. Uh, this influence comes from the psychic burden or psychic load which that personality is carrying. And even though there may be a certain superficial adjustment achieved in which the individual is successful in concealing a measure of his feelings, it is doubtful if any concealment is adequate in the presence of a small child whose intuitive and instinctive reactions are just too clear, too honest, and too penetrating. So I believe we can say definitely that an unhappy home will contribute often to an unhappy, maladjusted child. That this, in turn, will create other complexities which will reach out from the family life into society in general. The unadjusted person is a poor risk in business, a poor risk in social problems, will find difficulty in holding friendships, will always uh, be under a certain cloud of negation perhaps unreal, uh, without realizing the true cause or source of the trouble himself. He simply seems to be born to suffer, and almost everything that he does uh, is clouded or gloomed over in some way by pressures within his own nature. Thus, from the purely psychological level, I think there is no doubt that each person has a distinct effect upon his descendants. 
these descendants do take on his conditions. Uh, we find reference to this today in the findings of prominent educators. The public school system is reporting desperately upon the difficulty of handling children whose home life is not good. Most juvenile delinquency arises from improper home environment. This is not always the fault of the parent. Sometimes it is a misfortune of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, the consequences do linger on long after their causes seem to have perished. The greatest investment that we can make in the preservation of our kind is the guarding of the life of the young. Certainly up to the time that a child is 10 or 12 years old, its career and its character should be of basic importance to its parents. If this is not the case, we cannot hope that the church or the public school can meet this need. The neglected child is a very definite negative factor in the entire structure of human society. Also, children that are brought up to perpetuate the attitudes of their parents are very often victimized by this policy. We know too many cases where unhappy parents whose personal philosophies of life are unreasonable, immature, perhaps even psychotic, insist upon raising their children in complete conformity with the parental attitude. Thus children are trained away from integrity. They are trained away from natural optimism. Many are trained away from religion. Most are trained away from idealism and toward a very negative kind of materialistic adjustment with society. The parent who is responsible for these uh, unfortunate situations certainly must be regarded as being wrong. <coughs> what he is doing is not the thing that is best for the child. Many times now, parents will say very simply, and uh, they do not realize that they are saying it selfishly, that their first consideration is going to be their own happiness, that they have no intention of sacrificing their own purposes and their own desires for the security of their children. They go so far as to assume that such sacrifice is not necessary, that the child will grow up and adjust to the pleasures of the parent, that the parent wishes to do something rather eccentric, the child must drag along and come out of the situation the best they can. This is frequently a problem in the matter of step-parents and things of this nature, or children being placed in the hands of relatives whom the parents themselves could not possibly live with. All this type of policy, which is unfortunately too frequent, does definitely have an effect upon the child. And the child does take on, to a degree, these pressures and is very likely adversely affected by them. This is a rather simple psychological approach to the problem, but it is a reasonably valid one. There has been one major change in society, however, in the last 25 or 50 years, which has modified some of this problem. Uh, the old tight family patterns have largely broken up. Family tradition is less important to the average person of today than it was in the last generation. Family allegiances are not as strong as they used to be. And the domination of individual members of a family, not as common as it was 50 years ago. Thus, in the shaking loose of the family situation, with more and more families breaking with the older patterns, 
and building their own ways of life. There has been some uh, release from this very tight uh, continuance of family policy. It used to be assumed that the children simply inherited whatever the problems of the family were. The child must hate as the parent hated, vote as the parent voted, must have the same denominational interest religiously, must become a gradual shadow of the parental purpose, and must become the hoped-for outlet for the parental ambitions. The individual who did not do too well himself invested his hope of success in his children, bestowing upon them all his own frustrations and all the pressures which he had been unable to solve himself. We went through a very pathetic period in which uh, many first, second, or third generation uh, emigrants to this country uh, insisted that their children had to be rich had to take on all of the success mechanism that had made up the American way of life. In this desperate effort, many children were placed at very serious disadvantage. Uh, this was true also in education and is true today. There is not enough thought as to what the young person is fitted for. The only thought is, how can this young person get rich as quickly as possible? We know that in every graduating class from our universities, there are misfits that will burden us for the next 50 years. These persons would have been very good in some area, but they really did not consider, nor did their families consider, what these children were really good for. The whole problem was how to get this child into the most lucrative possible profession. As a result, lucrative professions are overloaded, and many lines of activity which are very useful and necessary are generally neglected. The uh, school psychologist uh, working with parents and children comes upon this problem continuously. Uh, the aptitudes of the child are of very little interest to an ambitious parent, <clears throat> The child is not old enough to assert its own authorities so that the twig is bent in almost any direction that parental interest goes. And the child has to live with this bend for the rest of his life. Occasionally you have rebellion, but not often enough. And a good deal of very bad psychological problem arises from this foolish failure to estimate the proper values of young people. So in all these ways, the attitudes of the parents certainly do descend upon the children. If these attitudes are good, the child is usually benefited thereby. If these attitudes are poor, the child suffers. Uh, it is only on comparatively rare occasions that we find parents deeply enough interested in the future of their children to really make the rearing of the young a science, a well-thought-through and carefully planned program. Uh, there is very little power at the present time to discipline children properly. The child becomes a nuisance and the parents abdicate in favor of the will of the young child. A young person discovering that he is able to run the whole family will almost inevitably do so and gradually reach a condition in which he is impossible. Correction is becoming more rare, and we might say that in many instances parents not only fear for their children but are afraid of them. This lack of basic strength in the parent certainly is also transmitted as a character defect upon young people. The problem as to whether children should be punished has always been a moot issue. Uh, there was a time when the child was overly punished, where it was simply the victim of parental neuro neurosis. 
Isolated examples of this exist even now. But for the most part, the modern attitude is not to correct the child at all. And this is very bad. The child has to be corrected. And we find very little evidence that intelligent correction, intelligently and consistently given, ever produced psychic damage. Uh, it is where the correction is unfair, where the parent is unreasonable, where the parent's emotions and attitudes are uncontrolled and it simply turns venomously upon the child. Under those conditions, serious damage is done. But the conscientious, thoughtful parent, patiently, wisely, and lovingly correcting the child as necessary, does not alienate the child, nor cause it to have any serious psychic trauma later. The neglect of this is much more likely to be desperately disastrous. So we can say that on the surface of things, there is a stream of continuity, just as there is in history. Uh, our nation today is confronted with the unfinished business of nearly two centuries. Each community is burdened with the various policies and practices that were established long ago. Each administration takes on certain embarrassments from previous administrations, and there must be a continuing policy based upon older policies. This descent of policy is noted as a factor in most national existences. Today, this descent of policy is not as fortunate as it used to be. Well, time moved rather slowly, where things changed, but slightly from generation to generation. Broad rules, anciently established, seem to be effective. But today, we are under such constant and continuous pressure that the need for contemporary planning becomes ever more obvious. And this is true also in families. It is useless for parents to try to bring up children as shadows of themselves. Times have changed. Conditions have changed. And the child who is not given certain contemporary footings will certainly suffer from general disorientation. This is a further challenge to the parent inasmuch as many parents have not established their own contemporary footings. They are living in generations that are gone, their focal point of attention is 10, 20, 30 years back, and therefore they are not well adjusted. And not being well adjusted, they do not adjust their children adequately. Today, individualism is also a powerful factor in the life of our people. Fewer and fewer persons are willing for any reason whatsoever to sacrifice their own attitudes. They are hardly willing to modify them. We have a constantly noted increase in irresponsibility towards duties and towards the acceptances of proper obligations in life. The person wishes to live as he pleases, do what he pleases, when he pleases. And this situation naturally works a terrible hardship upon homes. Today the home is really an economic institution based upon the theory that persons can live together a little cheaper than they can live separately. Even this is a fallacy, the way things are going at the present time. Because today, the average family is not made up of several persons sharing one group of assets. It is made up of individuals, each demanding his own group of assets. It is not unusual to find in a family of four persons today four television sets. This is because no one is willing to look at the program that anyone else wants to see. This is a little demoralizing on children who are told that they should work together and build together and love each other and be patient with each other and see no evidence of it in the home. This is true also of almost every detail of life. There are many homes today in which the members of the family do not eat the same food. And this isn't all due to dieting. It is simply due to the fact that individuals want what they want. And under this increasing 
uh, determination to do as they please. Uh, these persons are losing experiences of the greatest value to themselves. They become almost useless in industry because they will not cooperate well. They have no real interest in their work. They are interested only in the paycheck. Wherever the personal interest overwhelms all pride of endeavor and a rugged individualism dominates all relationships, it is certain that children will be the victims and that life in general will be impoverished for all concerned. We could carry this point much further, but there is really no need to labor it. I think the point that we want to make is evident from these remarks, namely that today the example factor in the relationship of parent and child is usually not good, and that out of this poor example pattern the child is affected. And he is affected by the example of the parent who is not really doing what is right. Therefore, this effect is based upon the sins of the father. It is based upon the sins of the parent group. For in uh, religion, sin differs distinctly from crime. An individual may be a sinner without being a criminal. An individual who fails in his moral responsibilities toward society may be regarded as a criminal. But the individual who breaks the laws of character, who variously compromises the principles within his own nature, who violates the basic values of conscious existence, who thereby goes against the common conscience of mankind. This person is said to be a sinner because he has broken faith with the laws of God as moral institutions, as spiritual laws in nature. So he may never be subject to any punishment as far as material law is concerned. He won't be arrested for it unless it is an extraordinarily severe uh, breach of ethics, but uh, he will be going against that which is the common experience of the greater good. And as he does this, he comes under this uh, heading of being a, an iniquitous person, one who is not good, one who is not uh, living truly, wisely, and lovingly according to the laws of his kind. This perpetuation of iniquity we do recognize everywhere in society. <coughs> then we must go to the more subtle traits, these traits which apparently do not relate directly to the psychological integration, but perhaps to the biological transmission of factors. Is it true that regardless of what we think or what we do or what our problems are, that our descendants will inherit from us some of the equipment with which they have to face life in their own turn? Is it possible that the individual who is by nature timid and has great difficulty in facing life fairly and squarely will have timid children? who will also have this same difficulty. If this is true, does this timidity descend in some way with the genes of life, or does this timidity result from early influence upon the child in this embodiment? Does the child take on the timidity in its earliest years of association with the parent? Does the child whose contact with life is almost limited to parents um, take, uh, take it for granted that this timidity is the natural and normal way of life and therefore fall into this pattern simply because it is impressed upon him at all times in his association with his own family? If this timidity becomes a powerful 
factor in his consciousness, and will begin to express itself when he goes to school, where he finds himself unable to hold up his end in a discussion or a dispute or even a good old back fence fight. He will find that this timidity uh, seemingly is much like that of a parent who may perhaps, apparently at least, have bestowed it upon him as a priceless heritage to have and to hold. Actually, I believe we are forced to assume that to a degree these traits do descend within the person, that these traits are more than mere association, although association may well intensify them, but that there are evidences that certain biological processes can be inherited would almost inevitably mean that certain psychological reactions based upon these biological factors will also arise within the personality of the child. I think we can find out definitely that dissipation in a family will affect the probabilities of healthy descendants, uh, that various uh, circumstances, either due to poor character or due to critical and dangerous situations like war, pestilence, and other natural disasters uh, may affect children, um, even though the child is not born for a number of years after the events occur. So all in all, we could add together both the environmental and the internal factors and say that the child is influenced. We also have a tendency as we go along in life to build up resentments against parents who have in various ways uh, added some burden to the pressure of living for us. We look back upon the uh, misfortunes of childhood and find it a little difficult to clear these images within our own consciousness. There are a great many persons who live through life with strong family resentments. And these resentments seem so severe and unreasonable and injustice that it is hard to forgive them. So there is a great deal of bitterness uh, as the result of the remembering of these unfortunate occurrences. This bitterness becomes therefore part of this load that seems to descend upon us from our parents and our ancestors. To look back over a childhood that has been unreasonable, uh, the result of extremely possessive or selfish attitudes on the parts of parents, neglect or indifference, or hopeless spoiling. All these create resentments against parents with which the average person has to struggle uh, throughout life. Even where a generally kindly attitude uh, covers these resentments with a surfacing of acceptances, the pressures may continue underneath, and a great deal of psychological pressure can be traced to these sources. The person has con uh, consciously conquered the situation, but inside of himself the pressures still canker, still create a uh, sense of dishonesty or evil. I know one case of a man over 80 years old who continued to have nightmares of his father beating him. The father had been dead for over 60 years but the terrible injustice of an extremely despotic father who became practically irrational if any uh, thing that he said was even questioned affected this man tremendously. Now in his daytime consciousness he was not much aware of his father's presence. He had certain deep resentments, but he held them under a certain broad cloak of Christian charity. But at night... In his subconscious, the whole unfairness of this thing, the whole desperate tragedy of it, continued to break through year after year. This person was seriously damaged. His life was seriously damaged. 
perhaps because as a child he had had a keener sense of justice. Perhaps he was more sensitive than other children in the same family who did not have this experience. Whatever the chemistry and psychic factor was, he was the one who took the brunt of the damage. And this damage uh, definitely affected him, led him to many uh, mistakes in his own life which would otherwise not have been likely, and gradually, even in the closing years of his life, when age began to result in a certain inevitable senility, and he began to drift back, as older persons mostly do, to the years of his childhood, in these older years, this whole tragedy became desperately real again. And uh, the very same family situation, which was full of mock piety, had also caused a revulsion in this man against religion because of what his father did with it, uh, the cruelty of the father in the administration of what he regarded as spiritual justice, but which was nothing more or less than basic egotism. This situation deprived the, ch the son of the consolation of a strong faith. It was hard for him to break through the tremendous religious pattern of his childhood, which was one of arrogance and hypocrisy and a strange adherence to the jots and tittles of a faith and absolutely no experience of Christian charity of any kind. So all in all, this man was damaged, and damaged seriously. And who can tell how far that damage would reach. The story went on pretty much to show that because of his own temperament, this man had damaged his children. And his children, having pretty well grown up in those days, and the grandchildren coming along, the grandchildren showed the damage. Every phase of this unreasonableness did go on. Now, there was an answer for the man himself had he been able to really work the thing through. Uh, there was a way, there were several ways in which he could have broken up this parental image, where he could have gotten it out of his own subconsciousness, but he did not know this, and he passed on before modern techniques were as advanced as they are now. So he, ne he really never did accomplish very much of a release. He died in the same bitterness that had overwhelmed his life uh, for a very long time because he did have an exceptionally long life. So all these things do make it seem as though there was some valid relationship between the past and the present as far as families and heredity are concerned. One thing we do realize, however, and uh, that is the point that most people do nothing with. We do realize that the human mind and the emotions, which are the principal carriers of psychic stress, is an instrument that can be controlled. We do not really accept the challenge of creating a personality for ourselves. In ancient Egypt, when the child was born, it was given a milk name. And this name was based largely upon the parental situation. It was assumed that the child was born in the likeness of its parents. That in the parental home, it would grow up. That it would have a kind of life there. But after a certain period, it would achieve maturity. And when it achieved maturity, it would then take upon itself the voluntary management of its own life. Therefore, under these conditions, it was given certain instruction in how to build a life for itself. And having been given this instruction and having been dedicated in the temple, this person was given his mature name, a name now which stood for an individual who was not the son of somebody or the grandson of somebody, but was somebody himself. It was assumed and taught in those days that when the person really became an individual, he cast off childish ways, as St. Paul says, 
and take uh, took upon himself the ways of maturity. I believe it would be quite possible to revive this type of thinking even today, to remind people constantly that after the body has been brought to maturity, after the mental and emotional nature has been individualized, it is within the power of the person to think his own thoughts, live his own life, and create his own character. The reason why we have such a deadly continuance of the old patterns is because no one tries to break them. They just accept them. If the individual had a poor childhood, he had a poor childhood, he's going to have a poor life, and the worst or best he can do about it is regret it. This is not true, but millions of people who have never questioned the problem simply assume that it is true. If father had a bad temper, son will have a bad temper, and there's nothing he can do about it. And if you ask him why he has a bad temper, he will simply tell you it was all due to father. Oh, this means actually that the individual is continuing the life of the father image in himself. He is not a person at all. He is simply his father in continuing as a thought form in himself. He is going to continue to have the same experiences that he started out with. He is going to continue to be overwhelmed by these images which were built up in childhood. These images take over. And lots of folks insist that these images have to take over. That there is really no way of preventing them from taking over. Here, I believe, we have a common social fault that is contributing to our private trouble. And that is the continuing uh, pressure against individualism in our society. There is almost nothing today to lure the person to be an individual. His fashions are set by persons he never knows. His job is one in which he is trained. He is not trained to think. He is trained to do what he's told. If he is trained to think at all, it is within the area of a specialization. He is not rewarded in any way for being himself. He is not encouraged to create a character, only to perpetuate the prevailing policies. He no longer goes out with an axe into the wilderness and hews a way of life. As a result, he is no longer resourceful. The strength of his own character diminishes to the degree that the strength of society increases and supports him. This is one of the economic problems of our day. The idea that the individual must be carried through practically every phase of life. Well, of course, the, uh, the other side of this is quite obvious like, or likewise. Namely, that our life has become so complicated that it is very difficult for the individual to be adequate on all levels. We realize more and more that the person is the victim of a social situation, and therefore that this social situation must protect him, must sustain him, must support him, and must provide him with practically every instrument of his own thinking and feeling. So today, regardless of the cause, the fact remains that the average person does not have any real inducements to be a person, to change his personal nature. Occasionally, the boss will call someone in and say, Look, Joe, you're a good man, but you've got a terrible temper. If you don't do something about it, we're going to have to fire you. This sometimes forms a magnificent therapy. The individual discovers that his financial security is endangered. Then, and then only, he is inclined to do a little thinking about it. But under normal situations, there is no thoughtfulness upon the changing of self. We are surrounded by constant inducements to gratify every appetite and instinct of our natures. 
there is very little inducement to grow, to be uh, individuals. Now, the only way in which you can really outgrow a parental image is to have one of your own to put in its place. If you are a strong person, you can gradually transform or transmute the center of rulership so that you are no longer ruled by an ancestral ghost, but are ruled by yourself, uh, taking over the administration of your own personal affairs. You no longer need to use the parental fa factor as an excuse for failure, as an exonerating factor of some kind. You need not use it as a defense mechanism. You can forget it by creating in its place a character of your own that is stronger and better. If nothing is done in this area, however, and very little ever is done, the person will drift along throughout life, very largely a, an instrument in the hands of a surviving thought form of parental um, lack of integration or integrity. So the person has to fight this out for himself. This brings us then to the entire opposite point of view and the possibility of the validity of the law of cause and effect in nature, which in the East is called karma. Uh, there is also a branch of yoga in India called karma yoga, and that is the art of divine union through the payment of debt. In other words, karma is not simply a continuous suffering. It is a motion toward the discovery and experience of reality through the paying of debt, through the acceptance of responsibility for the consequences of personal character. Now, how would the law of karma work into this involved pattern of heredity as we see it today? Is it a valid or more valid answer than heredity? Actually, it must be if we have a universe in which there is any integrity. It is absolutely impossible to assume with justice that the sins of the fathers actually can uh, make a good life reasonably impossible for the descendant. That the individual must inevitably be the victim of biology or psychology which has descended upon him as an irresistible factor. The only possible way in which the universe is just or can be just is that each person in some way must be responsible for what happens to him and must have the ability to make any change necessary for the restoration of his own integrity. At all times, the person must be in control of his own destiny, whether he knows it or not, whether he does anything about it or not. He must have this power of control. We have no evidence that he does not have such a power of control. We have considerable evidence that even the most unhappy and miserably maladjusted individual has recovered under certain conditions. We find the constructive effect of religion upon his life. We find many forces and conditions arising which prove that man can change. Alcoholics Anonymous has helped alcoholics to change when almost every other factor appeared to be impossible. So man, under a sufficient pressure of his own need, can change. He can wipe out the past if he wants to badly enough. Most persons not only do not want to, but do not realize that they can. Karma assumes, of course, that each individual has to be in a place that he has earned for himself. That in some way, the problems that fa he faces are his own problems and not essentially the problems of other people, uh, that he may be helped 
uh, through proper relationships with others is certainly true. That he can be apparently injured by such relationships is also a true, as true as far as we are able to tell. The law of karma, therefore, cannot operate successfully upon the concept of a one-life existence for man. The law of karma has to be a continuing process through life, not only through physical life as we know it, but through a vast pageantry of unfolding potential within man. In other words, what we consider to be cause and effect can only operate upon a being with a universal existence, with an existence that has uh, no immediate boundaries upon either its past or future. Uh, that this existence has to have had a long prehistory prior to its appearance here, and that it will have a long sub uh, subsequent post-history after what we call its appearance here. Karma then assumes that each person comes into the world for one essential purpose, and that is to grow. The growth is nature's design, and that growth for man is not merely the biological expansion of his nature or the psychological expansion of his culture. Uh, growth for man is the unfolding uh, or releasing of the infinite potential within himself, the potential by means of which it is conceivable and possible that every human being can be all things, that it is possible to assume that there is nothing necessary to man that is not available to him, that there is no state of growth or of unfoldment or of development which he can contemplate at all, which he cannot also attain. Thus, uh, growth is the primary purpose. Growth for man is a constant conflict between the power of the internal, which is the archetype, or which is the source of true motion, and conflict with the external, which is for a for most part a one-life perspective. Therefore, we may say that the conflict in man is between the eternity of himself and the time-bound nature of himself. The individual who experiences something of his own eternity is liberated and released from a very large part of the pressure of immediacy. The individual who recognizes that down through the course of ages he has personally accumulated a great deal of unfinished business and that this unfinished business must sometime be finished in order that his nature can be released from the pressures of his own mistakes. When the individual realizes this, he is then beginning to think in terms of karma. He is beginning to realize uh, that heredity, if it functions as is assumed, and environment, if it exercises the pressures we associate with it, that both of these factors must be instruments of karma. Both of them must operate in a way by means of which they contribute something to the final emancipation of man from the limitation of his own mistakes. It is therefore quite conceivable, certainly in philosophy it is more reasonable, that when an individual arrives in this world and finds that he's in a rather um, uncongenial environment, that in some way this lack of congenialness is a factor in growth. That actually the individual is always able to control this situation within himself if he has the insight. Uh, the true evidence of that lies in the very same family situations that we have mentioned. We mentioned some of the horrible examples, but we must now point out the peculiar inconsistencies which also arise. 
For example, in the family of this elderly man I mentioned, who had these nightmares of his father up to the time of his death, he was one of a very large family. There were many children. None of the others had this experience. It was his unique experience to take on this condition in this way. All of them admitted that father was a despot. All of them admitted that he treated mother miserably. Uh, but each one took a different reaction uh, from the same experience. One simply said, I left home as soon as I could and left the old fogey behind. Uh, they held no essential resentment. They considered father psychically and spiritually just as dead an issue as he was physically by that time. They felt that he had been unfair, but what were the reactions? One individual decided that there were certain advantages in being like father, because one thing that father did get was service. <laughs> no one questioned him, no one doubted him, no one ever contradicted him. Father lived his life just exactly as he pleased, and this seemed very intriguing to some of the children. I thought it was a pretty good idea, basically. One of the others decided that the last thing in the world he would ever be was like father. He was totally disgusted with the old man. So he went out, and when he married and established a home, he was a very patient, quiet, generous, perhaps a little too much on the spoilage side of the situation, because he definitely did not want to be like father. Here are two children growing in the same family, one found in father, a very practical example with desirable possibilities, the other an impossible example uh, to be avoided at all cost. Some paid no attention. You ask one of the boys, how did he get along with father? He says, well, I don't really remember. I don't think it was too good, but I haven't paid much attention to it. <laughs> this is the way everyone reacted differently to this one man whose influence, therefore, was largely modified by something else, something that the child had of itself. Now, the meek side of the child was traced to mother in some cases, for she was one of these very patient people. Perhaps the ones who were patient took on something from her. We may assume that there was a mixed situation here in which some blended with one type of personality and others with the opposite type of personality. But the fact remains that each of these persons was an individual, that each of these persons, born in the same environment, raised in the same environment, reacted differently to it. And we find this a, a so continuous a situation today everywhere appearing, that it must gradually dawn upon us that heredity, if it exists, as we generally think it does, is not a primary but a secondary factor. That heredity can be a kind of immediate, intimate environment. There are two kinds of environmental pressures, therefore. The person in the body has the body itself for an environment. This body environment itself, with certain physical and psychical tendencies, may definitely be inherited. Then it has another kind of environmental heredity, the world, the time, the place, the conditions in which it is born. But all of these situations only modify or in some way affect that which is the person himself. The person is not the heredity. The person is someone who can be affected. But being a person can also control or dominate this heredity if they so desire. This person, however, is as a personality a mixed blessing also. The person himself coming into the world is not perfect. 
He comes into the world with a variety of pressures, just as the incredible father in this story did. This tyrannical man was a person, and his tyranny was only an evidence of the fact that he was at war with himself. Whether he realized it or knew it makes no difference. He was struggling against pressures within himself, which were, again, his own reaction uh, to the environment of his own childhood. But there was not only the environment to which he reacted, but there was a being capable of reacting. And it is in this area that Oriental philosophy places its emphasis, that behind the person, as we see him today, is an unfolding being a being with various degrees of attainments and abilities intrinsic in itself, that this being can have a temper entirely apart from father's temper, that this being can have a neurotic tendency which does not necessarily have to be inherited, <laughs> that this being is of some degree of wisdom or ignorance, some degree of attainment or failure to attain, has a standard of morality and ethics of its own, that this being also has its natural attitude toward religion, toward civilization, towards policy, towards everything that makes up life, and also that this being has its aptitudes, its talents, its abilities, and its preferences as far as activities are concerned. This being, therefore, does not come into the world as a Simon pure creature. This being is not something sinless and stainless in itself that is merely the victim of other situations. And very few great systems of philosophy have ever been willing to accept that this being was merely the byproduct of parental beings. In other words, that this being was merely a chemical result of the parental uh, factors. The being was an independent entity. This independent entity had an eternal existence of itself. And in this eternal existence, it was engaged in a large panoramic effort uh, to overcome its own ignorance, selfishness, stupidity, fear, and uh, avarice, and all these emotions. This being, then, was itself conditioned by itself. And everything which it blames upon other people as being responsible actually is in some way related to itself, related to its own nature and related to its own essential needs. If we are willing to accept this, then we begin to see how the person uh, can face life free from the debilitating influence of this belief that their careers have been ruined by forces beyond their control. Before anyone can have a decent life, that individual must have the basic belief that he can create a decent life, that he has an inalienable right to do so, and that no circumstances out of the past or any other area can have any actual authority to destroy him unless he psychologically gives them this authority. Even then they cannot destroy him, but they can seem to hurt him, only because he gives them the right to do so. Now in childhood he cannot know this. In childhood he has to go through a series of very unpleasant experiences. But even in childhood, the nature of the being within him determines very largely the development of this experience pattern. All neglected children do not develop psychological pressures. Many do. But if the division takes place and one neglected child becomes a fine, upright citizen, Gaining from this neglect 
new incentives, new understanding, new insight, new sympathy for life. Something has been attained. And out of all of the abnormalities of childhood association, two types of attitudes arise, sympathetic and antipathetical. The individual either becomes deeply concerned with problem and wants to help it, or he becomes a rebel against problem and is determined to uh, take out a certain vengeance upon society. What, uh, which of these courses he instinctively follows is due to himself, due to his own ability to use experience which has been painful to accomplish ends which are desirable. This in no way excuses the parent for any failure to meet their responsibility. But the fact is that the failing parent is not, the, is not damaging the child as much as they believe that they are but they are damaging themselves themselves more than they have any idea they are damaging themselves. They are the ones who will have to pay for their mistakes. But uh, at the moment, it appears as though the child is the victim. Actually, the parent who makes these basically wrong relationships with life is burdening himself with a tremendous karmic load which he must pay for at some time. Now in the West, thinking about karma, there's always been one problem that has been difficult, and that is the machinery by which an entity or a being needing certain experiences must find a body suitable for these experiences and come into some cantankerous family where it is going to get just the kind of trouble it has earned. This seems to be a rather uh, sticky wicket from a philosophical standpoint. It looks as though there must be a very intensive IBM system somewhere that uh, measures out all these things. Uh, this is not necessarily true at all. We have made it far more complicated than it has to be. We have Im imagined a decarnate or unembodied entity wandering around the world like Lucifer, walking up and down the earth, looking, prying, wondering, mind-reading, and everything else to discover a family just as obnoxious as itself. <laughs> I strongly suspect that that is not the way it is done. I strongly suspect that what really happens is that it makes very little difference where that entity comes in. As long as it brings itself along, it is where it, is, it belongs. Because no matter what kind of a family it comes into, it is going to take a wonderful situation and ruin it, it is going to take a terrible situation and improve it, or it is going to leave the situations about as they are, if these situations are about as it is. You do not need to have a very highly specialized group of inevitables. All you have to do is to realize that what, no matter where we live, where we go, where we come from, we are always living with ourselves. We are living in the midst of a pattern by which we are going to interpret the good out of almost anything. We are going to interpret evil into many things. And where the whole world is going to look exactly as we expect it to look. If we were born in the golden age and we're not fit for it, we would be just as miserable as we think we are now. This is one of the reasons why it is very difficult to figure out just exactly what an orthodox heaven would be like, <laughs> because it is almost certain that it would not please the majority of candidates. Each one is only pleased by the kind of things he wants, and we have no evidence that death changes this 
extreme individualism as far as this matter is concerned. We want what we want. It is only in the processes of constructive attainment that our individuality appears to be inadequate. So if the problem remained that the individual simply has to bring himself back, all that he really requires is the railroad train to ride in on. It doesn't make any difference what co coach he is in. It doesn't make any difference who his fellow travelers are. And it does not make too much difference uh, the route that he follows. The only thing is, wherever he goes and however he gets there, he is himself when he arrives. And being himself is about all that is necessary to make life difficult for him. If he is, therefore, born into this individuality, as most people feel that they are, uh, he may later wonder why he landed in such a family, and at a certain stage of his thinking, it is almost enough to make an atheist out of him. <laughs> but if he gets past this dilemma and begins to examine himself carefully, as one man did whom I knew, he finally came up with the answer that seemed to be inadequate. He said, the more I think about it, the more I realize that I could not have been born into any other kind of a family. If I had been, I would have wrecked the family. The particular family that I was born into wrecked itself so that I didn't do very much additional damage. But however we want to think it through, uh, the law of karma or cause and effect applied to moral action seems to indicate that by our own psychic integration, we can take over any situation and make it the instrument of immediate right destiny. We can arrange our affairs so that any situation in which we find ourselves is educational, whether we like it or not. We can take uh, a pattern which might seem to be hopelessly inadequate and make it the basis of a glorious and wonderful existence. And we can ruin a beautiful life just as easily. So everything seems to come from the inside. We could take the body which we have received, which has its own impulses and its own physical instincts, and we impose ourselves upon it. The moment the person becomes master of the body, the hereditary factor of the body begins to diminish. The individual finally takes it, so, takes it over. His vibration takes over all of the scattered heredity vibrations that may exist. But if he never really takes it over, if he permits the body to take him over, if he lives almost entirely to gratify the body, then if his father was a gourmand, he will be a gourmand. If his father was an alcoholic, he will be an alcoholic. He may inherit some kind of subtle craving, some kind of subtle psychic pressure, but if the body is allowed to do it as it pleases, it will do what the bodies in that family have most frequently done, all the way down through history or time. And if we allow the body to rule, we are the product of the physical genealogy of our background and our family. But if we reach a point where we discover that the body is here to serve us, that it is a useful instrument, that we can control it, we can direct it, we can administer its various functions. Then the body becomes ours. It becomes our place of abode. It's like inheriting the old family manse, which occurs every once in a while. You find one of these wonderful old houses, such as are rapidly disappearing from Bunker Hill at the present moment, and you go into one of them and you suddenly discover you have inherited it. It is one of your ancestors and it was left to you free and clear in the family will. Here you'll find ancient pictures, ancient dirt, too many coats of paint, a great deal of gingerbread. Uh, you will also find old heirlooms, rickety furniture, and perhaps a few really valuable old items hiding in there somewhere. Those precious antiques, which were worth 60 cents 50 years ago and $500 today. 
But whatever you find, you can either move into that house and just live in it. You can gradually submerge your own attitudes toward it, or perhaps you never had any to submerge. So you can just simply continue the old process, dust the same old furniture. Uh, you can leave everything exactly as it was and just keep on living there. That's one attitude. If you do, you will gradually look more and more like the original owner uh, and will ultimately be laid away in the same way unless the freeway comes along and takes the house. And that may be the only release you have. On the other hand, you can go into this house and you can decide to make it fit you. You can get rid of what you don't want. You can sell off what you don't need. You could even have a complete remodeling job done, and you'll get it just the way you want it before the freeway takes it. It may take it anyway, but then again, all houses come and go. But you can move into this house and make it an example of you. If you like things simple and clean lines, you can achieve it. If you like certain colors, you can paint the house. You can take it and accept it as it is, or you can make it an expression of yourself. Same thing with your own body. Now, we may also assume that certain phases of mental attitudes or emotional pressures might be considered hereditary. You can move in on those exactly the same way. You can say, I have thoughts that I don't care for. I think they're a little mid-Victorian or a little ancient. Not quite old enough to be genuine antiques, however, and have uh, classical significance. Therefore, if we don't like them, we can get rid of them. We can do anything we want to to this person as long as what we try to do does not exceed the capacity of the being in us. If it is too great a change, we won't make it anyway because all we can do is bring this house or this situation into harmony with our own essential nature. If something is in, uh, to us is unjust, we can change it. If it is beautiful, we can preserve it. If it needs repair, we can restore it. We can do what we will within our capacity, and gradually we emerge as self-embodiments. We emerge as persons. Now, why we don't often change too much from the appearance of the parental situation is socially understandable. If you study the so-called physical progress of man, you will find that he is making these incredible leaps into the future that sometimes dismay us a little. He seems to be growing up too fast for his own good and everyone else's. But when you study the true life of man, when you study his culture, when you study his thoughts, his dreams, his aspirations, his convictions, you will find that they do not change so rapidly. The person who feels that he's exactly like father is also exactly like a hundred million other people beside father. He is about where millions of human beings are. Uh, he is a little selfish. Father was a little selfish. So is the rest of mankind. He was a little bit uh, unwise in his selection of profession. Most folks are. So that many things that we consider to be individual peculiarities are really evidences of the fact that we are all human and in our humanity are very much alike that all of us have these struggles to go through. All of us have to make adjustments. All of us find something wrong with the world in which we live. Some of us try to do something about it. Others allow the world to overwhelm them. But there are vast groups of these people. Consequently, almost any situation in which we find ourselves, no matter where we are embodied, we are going to find many links of humanity between ourselves and our families, our parents, and our ancestors. We are going to have the same selfishness that hurt them, the same egotism that disabled their lives, 
We're going to have the same self-seeking which distinguished their careers. These are part of a common humanity. And as we are part of that humanity, we are fighting this in our own individual lives. We have vices in common, but virtues have to be individually attained. But others are trying this also. So everywhere, if we are growing, we are with one group. If we are failing to grow, we are with another group. But we are not totally isolated. No individual is completely different from all other people. To think so is sheer arrogance. It would naturally seem, therefore, that we are going to find that we are much like all those whom we know. We are, have much in common with our friends and families. And as our own individuality finally does take over, it doesn't mean that we suddenly find ourselves completely different from everyone we do. We merely move into another level of their own insight. We begin to discover in them values that perhaps we did not see before. So the growth of the uh, unfolding entity in us is so gradual, so uh, generally obscured in the collective pattern of things, so similar to the processes which we associate with heredity and environment, that uh, it is not easy to clearly differentiate it. Uh, the real value lies in the moral importance of the acceptance of a conviction, namely that we are persons, that as persons, we are only victims to the degree that we permit attitudes to victimize us, our own attitudes. The fact we have had a bad deal somewhere along the line does not really have any essential meaning. It only means that we have had an exceptional lesson of some kind which we had to learn. Perhaps we are paying a debt for a bad deal that we have given someone else. And in the course of life, we have all been troublesome, just as we are troubled. So that in the real analysis, the bad deal is only an interpretation. And if we can get a different attitude toward it, we can get new values. If we were able to help people as they grow up, particularly as they approach maturity, to realize that maturity is a declaration of individual independence from what we might term hereditary factors. That in the, at the maturity of the individual, he declares himself to be different from environment or heredity. He has become a person. This person will not from that time suffer from any sins except his own. But if he makes no effort to overcome the negative situations that have surrounded perhaps his earlier life, then he is guilty of a sin of omission. If having a certain characteristic which he finds not desirable, he does nothing about that characteristic, then the sin becomes his own. For in every case, the individual is able, if he so wills, to make certain changes in his own nature. If he does not make these changes, then he is a party to the disaster which he blames others for. Everyone is here with a disposition to change. This is a universal fact. We have no evidence of anyone with a perfect disposition ever living here. <laughs> if he did, he may have been ruined. But anyway, <laughs> we are here because of need. This is not really a vacation. This is a job. But many people enjoy their work. If they do, then they grow well in this world. If they grudge growth, then they grow miserably. If they think only of comfort, most will be disappointed. If they think only of the fulfillment of their own ambitions and desires and judge all things personally in terms of whether they like them or not, it is going to be rough. But if the individual admits that he is here because he is imperfect, that his imperfections of his own brought him here, 
It brought him into the only place that he can come when he comes here, into a life composed of the imperfections of others. That his parents are not perfect, but neither is he. Perhaps their delinquencies are a little glaring in some cases. But regardless of this, he is here, he has gotten in, he has made a tremendous effort and gone through a long and uh, difficult training as a child growing up in order finally to reach a maturity that is going to be worth it. And if his childhood with all its miseries produces only a maturity with more miseries, we have come to a vicious end to the whole problem. It was tough to get here. It was a little difficult for the relatives also, by the way. And it is not easy to grow up in this world with summer complaint, whooping cough, measles, etc. Nor is it easy to struggle through the long years of schooling that we have to go through or to dodge, if possible, the uncertainties of com common culture and civilization, and finally, by brute force and awkwardness, to reach a point of independence or individual self-expression, where everybody pats us on the shoulder. They don't give us a gold watch anymore. Those are too expensive. But anyway, uh, we get some indication of family benevolence, and we start out, and maybe before we know what we're doing, we're married and start a family of our own. But when we reach this point of independence, which we have fought for, struggled for, suffered for, what do we do with it? We have now the right to think. Having the right, we are content not to exercise it. <laughs> Having the right to be an individual, we prefer to drift with the crowd. Having a right to outgrow the failings or faults that seem to have descended to us, we are content to nurse them for the rest of our own lives. We do not take hold of life at the critical moment and suddenly make this life our own. We do not take hold of it, mold it, change it, modify it until it becomes a clear expression of a greater purpose in ourselves. Of course, if we do not do something of this kind, it simply means that we don't have within us as yet a sufficient maturity to impel this. If we do not have this maturity, then nature has to keep on pressing upon us need and emergency, problem, until finally the individual character reacts constructively. So I, will, I firmly believe myself that the heredity and environment, two phases of one external, are modifying factors. They provide us with the pressures necessary to cause a reaction within ourselves. An old Greek said that if he had a stone on which to brace the fulcrum, he could turn the earth over. Well, in a sense, the stone upon which the falcon can be braced is heredity environment. It is the thing that would make it possible for us to turn the stone of life over. But if we do nothing, then we simply drift in the common patterns. We allow biology to set in on us psychologically. We allow environment to move in until we become merely uh, dead bodies floating on a sea that will drift wherever it will. If, however, we take hold of destiny, we shall then discover that we are beings, that we are selves, that we have inner character, and that this character can only be ascribed to one source, namely that we have had time to build it, that we have lived, that we have created, that we have done right and done wrong, we have made laws and broken them. We have gradually, through a vast period of time, built up within ourselves as beings a true character which is our own. It is this true character which is the primary concern of life. Our job is to adv advance this true character. And in order to advance it, we must discover that we have it. In order to know that we have it, we cannot analyze the character in, ex in itself. We can only analyze it as we would like to analyze God, by observing its consequences in action. We discover character only by discovering what character does in the changing of our personal life and personal destiny. But if we are able to accept the challenge 
of the uh, maturity of a self within us. Then I think if we want to think of heredity, we can say safely and honestly that the sins of the fathers do not descend upon us any longer. In fact, that perhaps they never really did. We didn't need the sins of the fathers in order to get into trouble. We had our own, and we were doing a magnificent job of, in of increasing them. We do not need to look around somewhere and say, he's to blame. There are enough attributes and characteristics in each of us to account for practically every trouble we've got. But there are also within us these attributes that solve trouble. And out of this past, present, future pattern, out of heredity, environment, karma, and all these other elements which we can consider, comes the simple statement that we are alive now that we are what we are now, and that by a direct effort of being now, we can improve now. We can achieve liberty from pressure now. We can forget old grievances now. And at any moment that we so desire, we can declare our emancipation from the tyranny of outside factors bring our lives into harmony with our internal purposes and live according to the convictions that we hold most dear. Only when we take this step do we become mature, do we become then free agents using bodies, using life, using experience for the gradual maturing of our own inner consciousness. As soon as we realize this, we are free from everything except ourselves. And from ourselves we can never be free. And the law of karma is not only a punishment for our misdeeds, but a constant building up of constructive factors uh, so that in the end, the efforts we have made to grow become the great and wonderful uh, spiritual values uh, which stand with us and support us through all the periods of time. And if we look at it that way, I think we can make something a little more interesting and valuable out of this problem of heredity and karma. Well, thank you very much, folks. I guess our time is up. I've got some other interesting announcements which I would like to call to your attention. This is an announcement of probabilities. Uh, not of certainties. In connection with the Siamese art now on display in our library, we hopefully expect a showing of color slides on Thailand and Cambodia on Sunday afternoon, May 26 at 2 p.m. in our auditorium. Uh, Miss Donna Matson, currently teaching at Laguna Beach, was in Siam on the occasion of the 2500th anniversary of the Paranavana of the Buddha and has agreed to show numerous slides of that ceremony and of Cambodia and will narrate some of her experiences while traveling in these countries. Many groups in Los Angeles have had the pleasure of hearing Miss Matson already. We hope she will be with us next Sunday afternoon. According to uh, unconfirmed rumor, she will be. So uh, uh, we will have further confirmation a little later, but come prepared for the probability that it might occur. Um, uh, we have a lecture number 48 on reincarnation and crime and the law of karma and we think that some of that material will be of interest to you in connection with the morning lecture we also have a, a nice group of the little Peter Porper handbooks on religion and Zen and things of that, that nature and um, we will have a special lecture on Tuesday evening May 28th in our auditorium a repeat lecture for a group, Planetary Influence in the Human Soul. This uh, talk is being given for the Redunda Beach Church of Religious Sciences, Science. Uh, as it was not reasonably possible for me to go to Redunda Beach at that time, the church decided to come up here. So they have buses and everything to get them here, and we'll have a meeting on uh, May 28th, Tuesday evening, on that subject, and it is open to the public. Uh, the church, however, has had some expenses of its own in connection with it, so the donation for that lecture is set by the Church of Religious Science and not by us. The admission is a dollar and a half. 
We also have in the lobby this morning and in the gift shop some uh, something we have almost given up hope of ever seeing again, and that is a group of good and useful second-hand books in our fields of thought. A mysticism, philosophy, uh, comparative religion, astrology, a number of scarce items, so that if you're looking for that kind of book, we hope you will visit the lobby and look at the books there and also see more of them in the gift shop uh, after the lecture. And we also have some very interesting new everyday cards and things of that nature in the gift shop. And in the library, we have a number of valuable and interesting and delightful prints for those who are art lovers, which you hope you will uh, visit. And also, don't fail to take a look at the Siamese exhibit and prepare yourself for the probability of hearing more about it uh, next Sunday afternoon. Our own subject for next Sunday morning, the familiar sea and the unknown ocean, which will be a further discovery of uh, our discussion of the experience of Tao uh, as perfect freedom. The story of Taoism is a story that has no end, because it, every phase of it is capable of infinite interpretation. Our subject next uh, Sunday morning will deal with Taoism in Chinese philosophy as a philosophy of freedom. So we hope you will be with us at that time. Thank you very much.